Due to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. In the early morning hours of April 10th, 1836, Rosina Townsend woke up to a knock at the front door of her New York City brothel. The madam was used to letting customers in at all hours of the night, so she quietly slipped out of bed to unlatch the door. Still in her nightclothes, Rosina guided the man to his room and turned around, eager to climb back into bed. But then she noticed a strange light coming from the parlor. It was an oil lamp, sitting on a marble top table in the empty parlor. There were only two lamps like it in the house. Both were supposed to be in bedrooms on the second floor of the brothel. As Rosina walked over to the lamp, she was struck by a cold gust of wind. The door to the backyard was hanging open. This seemed strange. It was an unseasonably cold spring night in New York, and it had snowed only a few days earlier. But someone had still left the door open. She grabbed the lamp and headed upstairs. All the brothel's bedroom doors were locked, except for one. Helen Jewett's room. Rosina was surprised that Helen, a 23-year-old sex worker, would leave the door open. She cautiously pushed on the door. Suddenly, a column of hot black smoke poured out into the hallway. Through the smoke, Rosina saw the full, horrifying scene inside Helen's room. The bed was on fire, with Helen's motionless, burning body still lying on top of it. Within hours, the entire city of New York was talking about the murder of Helen Jewett. And once the city's new tabloid newspapers picked it up, the case quickly became one of the biggest and most divisive crimes of the 19th century. This is our first episode on the murder of Helen Jewett. This week, we'll cover Helen's life as a sex worker in New York City and her relationship with Richard Robinson. Next week, we'll dive into the aftermath of her death and why her murderer was never brought to justice. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. Helen Jewett went by many different names in her short life. Whenever she wanted a fresh start or moved to a new city, she would change it. But when she was born in Augusta, Maine on October 18th, 1813, her parents named her Dorcas Doyan. The young Dorcas was born into a large working class family. Her father was a shoemaker who had lived in rural Maine for his entire life. He struggled with alcoholism and could rarely hold down a job for more than a few months. When Dorcas was around 10 years old, her mother died. Unable to care for her anymore, her father sent her away and arranged for Dorcas to be a live-in servant for a wealthy family. It turned out to be a major opportunity for the young girl. Domestic work was easy for Dorcas. She quickly became one of the most in-demand young servants in the city. In 1825, when Dorcas was 12 years old, She got a more permanent position as a servant in the house of Nathan Weston, Chief Justice of Maine's Supreme Judicial Court. Judge Weston agreed to keep her as a housekeeper and playmate for his daughters until her 18th birthday. With that, Dorcas had found a home again. While she cooked and cleaned for the Weston family, Dorcas carefully observed the customs and habits of the upper classes. She made a point to mimic their speech patterns and etiquette. Little by little, she learned how to blend in among the New England elite. Would you care for some coffee, Mrs. Royal? Oh, yes, I would. Thank you, miss. You've done well with that one. I don't think I have ever seen a servant as sweet and graceful as your little... Dorcas. Isn't she precious? We took her in about a year ago. She fits in with the children so well you'd think she was one of my own. (laughs) And when she's not fixing our coffee or hanging the laundry, her nose is always in a book. Here you are. 
Oh, you might be the most darling child I've met in this town, maybe even in the state. I simply must include you in my book. I is that all right, Mrs. Weston? Of course, the world deserves to know our little Dorcas. Ah, perfect. Soon everyone will know your name. <laughs> Dorcas's good manners even made her into a bit of a local celebrity when a writer named Anne Royal wrote about her in one of her popular travel books. But when Anne Royal asked Dorcas for her age, she claimed to be 11 years old, even though she was really 13. She would continue to lie about her age for her entire life, always claiming to be two to four years younger than she actually was. The past seemed to be a fluid thing for Dorcas, who always preferred fiction to fact. Dorcas may have been a poor shoemaker's daughter, but she felt she belonged in the upper class, and she acted like it. Dorcas's life was better than the average servants. She had access to education and books, comfortable living quarters, nice clothes, and invitations to parties and dances with Judge Weston's daughters. And she was smart. The Westons quickly recognized Dorcas's intellect and worked to foster it. They encouraged her to engage in the worlds of music, art, and foreign languages. They also gave her plenty of time to read. She loved the popular novels and poetry of the time and developed a lifelong love for the writings of Lord Byron. Dorcas's ability to read and her seemingly unlimited access to books was a rare thing for a girl in the 1820s. At the time, women's literacy rates in the Northeast United States were still trailing men's, but they were growing quickly. Due to advances in printing technology, books had become easier and cheaper to produce. For the first time, nearly everyone in North America had access to mass-produced novels and pamphlets. Religious leaders and moral reformers worried that these popular texts would lead to corruption among young people who might replace their habit of studying the Bible with modern novels. They warned that solitary reading allowed teenagers, especially teenage girls, to indulge their emotions and sexual urges, which could lead to moral depravity later in life. Luckily for Dorcas, the Westons didn't worry about that. They let her read anything in their library and allowed her to go to the nearby bookshop as much as she wanted. But by her late teenage years, it seems that Dorcas began going to the bookstore for more than just reading. Dorcas fell in love with an older man who would talk to her all about books. Historians believe that this man was Harlow Spaulding, the owner of a bookshop only five minutes from the Weston house. Uh, Harlow, I just finished reading The Corsair, and I simply must talk about it with you. Please tell me that you have Byron's next book in stock. <laughs> I sent for it a week ago. Patience is a virtue, Dorcas. I don't think I can wait much longer. <laughs> Look at me. I'm blushing just thinking about it. Oh, forgive me. But just imagining loving someone so much that you die when they depart. Oh... Isn't it just the most romantic thing you can think of? <laughs> you are adorable. I thought the ending was more tragic than romantic, but... <laughs> I suppose you're right. You know so much more about literature than I do. At the rate you're going, you'll be caught up to me in no time. Say, would you be interested in another little walk by the river tonight? Uh, once the master and mistress are asleep? I would be thrilled to see those blushing cheeks again. Well, I'd be more inclined to say yes if you had my book, but I can make an exception. Unfortunately, this budding relationship may have ruined Dorcas's life in Augusta. She was supposed to stay in the Weston house until her 18th birthday, but moved out a year early in the fall of 1830. According to a letter from Judge Weston, she was pushed out of the city's social circles after having premarital sex with a young man in town. It is unclear who the man was, though Harlow Spaulding is a strong possibility. It's also possible that her first partner was a male member of the Weston family, or Judge Weston himself, and that she was sent away to preserve their reputation. But whatever the case, 17-year-old Dorcas Doyan was forced to leave Augusta and move to Portland, Maine. When she got there, she changed her name for the first time. 
Dorcas Doyen became Maria Stanley, and as a young woman without money or a family, she turned to sex work to make ends meet. After a few months in Portland, she moved to Boston, where she changed her name again. This time, she became Helen Marr. Sex workers commonly used pseudonyms to protect their identity, but few had as long of a string of them as Helen. And when she moved to New York City in 1832, the 19-year-old changed her name once again to Helen Jewett. At the time, Helen Jewett was only the latest in a string of personas. She had no idea that this name would carry her to the highest levels of New York society and then to her grave. The early 1830s were a time of dramatic growth for New York. The completion of the Erie Canal transformed the city, turning a large port town into a key waypoint between the Atlantic Ocean, the Great Lakes region, and the massive American interior. Goods, money, and people surged through the city. Between 1830 and 1835, more than 70,000 people moved onto the island of Manhattan alone. One of these transplants was 19-year-old Helen Jewett, the woman formerly known as Dorcas Doyan. Helen had left her birth name behind and headed to New York with a plan to be a sex worker. New York's sex trade was thriving alongside the city. Unattached young men had moved to the city in droves, looking for clerkships in local shops. These men lived in cramped all-male boarding houses and often ached for female companionship. Older men, as well, would often arrive in the city on business trips and seek out commercial sex in their free time. By Helen Jewett's arrival in 1832, New York was America's number two city for sex work, second only to New Orleans. And despite the rigid moralism of the 19th century, New Yorkers tended to quietly approve of and allow sex work at the time. Selling sex for money was not strictly illegal, And as long as the transaction took place in private, authorities turned a blind eye. But even though their work was done in the shadows, sex workers were anything but anonymous. Many of them were well-known members of their communities and neighborhoods and made no effort to conceal their trade. This was especially true of those in the highest echelons of the business who often lived in lower Manhattan, while sex workers in lower-income neighborhoods like the Five Points District would solicit their customers on the street, Manhattan sex workers let the clients come to them. These women served only a small number of regular clients and dressed up their transactions with flirtation and romance. They lived in one of the wealthiest parts of the city and served powerful businessmen and politicians, which meant they were hardly ever investigated or arrested. 19-year-old Helen was already experienced in selling sex by the time she arrived in New York. She knew how to play the part of a sophisticated lady and easily inserted herself into the world of high society sex work. Helen moved into a brothel in downtown Manhattan, frequented by wealthy merchants and their younger, not-so-wealthy clerks. Helen quickly became so popular that a newspaper editor would later claim she was well-known to every pedestrian on Broadway. Helen! Oh, Mr. Attree, I didn't recognize you with your cravat on. A girl on the town can only be expected to remember so much, I suppose. Where are you off to? You know I walk this route to deliver my letters. I can only hope that one of those letters is addressed to me. Oh, well, let's see. Mr. Marston, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Harrison. No? It looks like there's nothing for a Mr. Attree in here. Try coming around the house more often. I've already been twice this month. My bank account is nearly empty. Oh, then I'll see you after your next payday. Ciao! By 1835, 22-year-old Helen had built up a small but consistent base of clients, each of whom was willing to pay handsomely to see her. She lived in a house with about a dozen other sex workers who each worked out of their rooms, paying the madam $12 per week for lodging. This was a very high price. A typical boarding house in 1835 would charge about $2 for the same amount of time. 
but Helen rarely worried about money. She made about $50 a week, which was an incredible sum for a woman at the time. She stuffed her closet with fine dresses and jewelry, and even hired a private maid to clean her room twice a day and help her get dressed for the evening. She went to the theater nearly every night and still had plenty of time to read her favorite books. In many ways, Helen was finally living the ideal upper-class lifestyle she had dreamed of as a young servant. Men would pay between three and five dollars each time they saw her. Considering that most of them made between four and ten dollars per week, this was a substantial investment. Sex workers at Helen's level did a lot more than have sex with their clients. They entered into a relationship with them, albeit one that was mediated by money, and often played the part of a wife more than a sex partner. Helen sent her clients long, flattering love letters. She read poetry with them, played cards, and even mended their clothing if they asked. She gave her clients the thrill of courtship and the emotional support of a long-term relationship without any burden of commitment. For those who wanted to bask in female attention without sacrificing their bachelor lifestyle, it was an ideal arrangement. Whenever she got close to a client, Helen gradually started to tell them more about her life and how she came to sex work. These stories were never true and often sounded like they were ripped from the cheap novels she read as a girl. Tales of a pure little girl forced into a life of sin by cruel lovers or mustache-twirling villains. Helen tailored her story to each customer. She wanted them to pity her or feel that they alone could understand where she came from. This false intimacy kept her clients coming back and paying handsomely. But because she was so emotionally involved, 22-year-old Helen also had to make it clear that sex work was her livelihood. To keep business going, she couldn't actually fall in love with any of the men that she saw. Most of her customers understood this, like her frequent client, George Marston. George was a typical customer for Helen. He was the son of a New England lawyer who moved to the city to work at a stationery store. He made low wages but still visited the brothel at least once a week, where he went by the name Bill Easy. <laughs> I win again! I told you never to challenge me to a game of cards. <laughs> if only I had listened. But before we start another game, would you like to come upstairs? I'll be so lonely tonight if you don't. After your letter? How could I say no? <laughs> come on, then. Wait, uh, before you take off your dress... Uh, I so appreciated that pincushion that you gave me last week. It was so well-crafted, you see, and even the women in the house were amazed by it. Get to the point, Bill, please. You want another piece of sewing from me? Well, I am in need of a new tablecloth. Include the dimensions in your next letter and I'll get to it. I'll expect a gift in return, though. You understand. Uh, of course, Helen. I'll enclose it in the envelope. Good. Now... Help me undo these clasps. Most of the time, Helen's strategy worked. Regular clients like George Marston rarely became jealous or territorial. Some even actively invited their friends to start seeing Helen. Though Helen was comfortable, life as a sex worker was never entirely safe. The threat of violence at the hands of a client was always present, and she occasionally had to ban someone from the house— because he acted inappropriately or got the wrong idea about their relationship. By June of 1835, 22-year-old Helen had become an expert in choosing her clients and maintaining her boundaries. But all that changed when she met Richard Robinson. According to some accounts, Richard first saw Helen being accosted by a drunk outside a Manhattan theater. What's a harlot like you doing in our fine theater, eh? Think you're special or something? Get away from me, you animal! Oh, help! Help! I'll need to look through your purse before I let you go, won't I? Hey! Step away from her! <clears throat> fine. Just having a bit of fun, see? Here's your purse, miss. Are you all right? 
I am now. Thank you. I don't know how I would have gotten out of that on my own. You were so brave to save me. Uh, I didn't even stop to think. Well, here's my calling card. You're welcome to visit me on Thomas Street anytime you'd like. Oh, Thomas Street. I'm afraid I don't have money for... Free of charge. The first time, at least. When he met Helen in June of 1835, 18-year-old Richard Robinson had just moved to New York City from Durham, Connecticut. His father was a powerful man, having served eight terms in the state legislature. Richard attended the best schools in the area before leaving for New York, where he found a job clerking for a cloth merchant. When Helen first met him, Richard seemed like a clever, chivalrous young man, but he had a dark side. He was a frequent patron of gambling houses and lower-class brothels, where he used the name Frank Rivers, and had already been in several scrapes with the police when Helen had met him. Richard entered into a relationship with Helen on the same terms as any other client. He would pay her in both attention and money, and he'd get sex, conversation, and something close to romance in return. But the lines between sex work and genuine intimacy quickly blurred. In the beginning of their relationship, 22-year-old Helen used all of her usual tricks on Richard. She sent him letters on fine stationery, telling him he was like no one she'd ever met before, and slowly revealing her tragic, made-up backstory. My dear Richard, you wish me to write you, but I already say so much when we're together that I find myself at a loss for words. I do not need to tell you again how much I enjoy your company. I think we can agree that I've already made that perfectly clear. I have met very few persons who I could share in all my feelings with, and you are one of those few. I love you madly. Devotedly yours, Helen. Her first few letters were almost identical to the ones she sent to other men, but as they continued to write to each other, Helen's writing became more honest and vulnerable. For two months, the couple seemed to be genuinely in love, but in August of 1835, their honeymoon period ended abruptly. Richard's secrets were suddenly revealed, and his true, dangerous nature became clear. Coming up, Helen and Richard's complicated love affair goes sour. Now, back to the story. In August of 1835, the relationship between 22-year-old sex worker Helen Jewett and 18-year-old clerk Richard Robinson started to lose its shine. First, Helen found out that Richard was visiting other brothels in New York City. Of course, Helen was in the business of infidelity, and most of her clients were probably seeing other women. But in Helen's eyes, Richard wasn't like the other men she served. He was an intellectual equal and romantic partner. He had led her to believe that they had an exclusive arrangement. Many of Helen's friends and colleagues knew about Richard's misdeeds, but he kept them silent by threatening to blow the brains out of any woman who exposed his infidelity to Helen. When she finally learned the truth, Helen was devastated. I can't believe you've done this, Richard! Done what? Been a young man in the city? You don't know how much it hurts to know I've been lied to. Oh, so you're allowed to be sleeping around telling all sorts of fantastic tales about your life while I wait around to earn your favor? It's different, Richard, and you know that. I thought you were different, too. Oh, don't cry to me, you whore! Richard! Take that back! (laughs) 22-year-old Helen had seen hints of Richard's dark side before. His letters often contained references to feeling like he was different from everyone around him or like no one understood him. He would often write descriptions of night terrors and violent fantasies in one line and then over-the-top declarations of love in the next. Helen initially thought he was romantic, but this incident forced her to see that Richard was just a selfish, angry man who didn't really care about her feelings. 
Helen broke off contact with Richard for a few weeks, but eventually forgave him. They continued to see each other through the fall and winter of 1835, falling into an all-too-predictable cycle of fights, breakups, and reconciliations. They may have also found their way into a life of crime as well. In several letters from the fall of 1835, Richard referred to another one of Helen's clients as the cashier. Richard seemed to be intent on avoiding the cashier, but listed off several names for Helen to mention to him. In one particularly cryptic letter, Richard warned Helen that she could get hurt if she made a mistake. It's possible that Richard drew Helen into an embezzlement scheme, using her connections to further his own goals. The cashier was either in on the plot or an investigator looking to arrest Richard. In November of 1835, the pair had their second major fight. Richard became angry with Helen and threatened her physically. But when she started to pull away, he begged for forgiveness. Helen seemed to write this incident off and take him back easily. Just days after the November blowout, she promised to give him a tiny portrait of her for his bedroom. The exchange of miniature paintings was a common courtship tactic in the 19th century. The fact that Helen brought it up indicates that Richard was still a romantic prospect, even as he made her life more and more difficult. But just a few days after he asked for forgiveness, Richard sent a letter suggesting they break up, saying that he was no longer worthy of Helen's affections. Helen wouldn't hear it, though. She convinced him to rekindle their relationship again. This dramatic back and forth continued into the spring of 1836, when Helen was 23 and Richard was 18. Both parties seemed to understand that they were not good for each other, but neither of them could walk away. Every argument or physical fight culminated with a promise to stay together. Helen continued to see clients, which angered Richard, and he continued to visit other sex workers to get back at her. Helen's friends could see the toll that this relationship was taking and begged her to forget about Richard. But Helen refused. She only became more desperate for his attention. The couple hit their final breaking point in March of 1836. Helen moved into a new brothel operated by 39-year-old Rosina Townsend, who she had worked with throughout her time in New York. Shortly after she moved in, 23-year-old Helen came to Rosina in tears, telling her that Richard sent back all of her letters and gifts from the past 10 months. He had requested that she do the same. Richard had threatened to break up with Helen countless times before, but the mutual return of letters was far more serious and formal than she had ever seen before. It really felt like the end. Helen told Rosina that she suspected Richard was getting married to another woman. But this was unlikely. Richard was only 18 years old and seemed to enjoy his bachelor lifestyle. It's possible that Richard was involved in an unplanned pregnancy and marrying the mother to cover up for it, or that he had jumped into a fast-moving relationship to distance himself from Helen. Regardless of the reason, Helen wanted to have the last word. She wrote to Richard before agreeing to return their letters, She insisted that he come to see her one last time and threatened to humiliate him if he didn't. She hinted at Richard's crimes, implying that she could expose his embezzlement schemes whenever she liked. Helen's threats worked. Richard agreed to visit her on the night of his 19th birthday. And so on April 9th, 1836, Helen told Rosina to not allow in her regular Saturday night customer, George Marston, and let Richard in instead, under his pseudonym, Frank Rivers. Come in. Rosina, a bit of a change of plan tonight. My usual Saturday visitor isn't coming. Someone else is. Frank Rivers. The same man whose letters you were blubbering over last weekend? Well, yes. But I've decided to take him back. My heart will break in two if he proceeds with marrying anyone, and... Besides, I know how to keep him in line now. That one never seemed right in the head if you ask me. But you girls make your own decisions. I'll let him in at nine. Thank you, Miss Townsend. 
Rosina Townsend opened the door for Helen's guest between 9 and 10 p.m. on April 9, 1836. Richard had his face covered by a cloak, but Rosina knew him well enough to recognize his voice and stature. He went straight to Helen's room and stayed there until two hours later when Helen emerged to ask Rosina for a bottle of champagne. Rosina brought the champagne and glasses up to Helen's room. Helen invited the madam to have a drink with him, but Rosina turned her down. She talked to Helen for a few minutes in the hallway and saw Richard lounging in Helen's bed through the open doorway. He was calmly reading by candlelight. As Helen said goodnight and shut the door, it seemed to Rosina that the couple had once again decided to make up with each other. That was the last time Helen Jewett was seen alive. Rosina headed off to bed. She slept soundly until the early hours of the morning when she awoke to someone pounding on her bedroom door. You know the rules. If you want to leave after midnight, get your woman to let you out. Can't have just anyone coming and going. But she's... Never mind. A stupid boy. The conversation was so short that the man in Rosina's bed didn't even wake up. She fell asleep, but then was woken again by another knock. It was a regular customer there to see another sex worker in the house. Rosina verified his identity and led him upstairs. But as she shuffled back to bed, she noticed a lamp in the parlor, one that should have been in an upstairs bedroom. Then she saw the backyard door hanging open. Someone had tried to get out and fast. Rosina started checking the second floor bedrooms and was surprised to find Helen's door unlatched. Girls would almost always lock the door from the inside when they had a visitor. With the lamp still clutched tightly in her hands, Rosina pushed the door open. The huge wooden bed in the corner of Helen's room was on fire and her small, charred body lay motionless on top of it. She was naked with three bloody wounds marking her forehead. Rosina immediately screamed for help. Eventually, she got the attention of a group of night watchmen standing outside. Within minutes, the men started dousing the bed with water. Once the fire was out, the watchmen turned to Rosina to ask her who could have killed 23-year-old Helen Jewett. Rosina only had one suspect in mind, Richard Robinson. As the sun set over New York City on the night of April 10th, 1836, dozens of people gathered outside of the old city jail. They carried lanterns and warm winter coats, ready to camp out all night if needed. A few members screamed into the night air, hoping their voices would reach one of the cells. Richard! Let us know you're alive up there, Richard! We know you did nothing wrong! They were waiting to hear from Richard Robinson, a 19-year-old who had been arrested for the murder of 23-year-old sex worker Helen Jewett. Helen's body had been found early that morning. Richard was the last person she had been seen with, and now... He was the prime suspect. But these people weren't convinced. News of the brutal murder had spread through the city by word of mouth, and many people didn't believe that a mild-mannered, well-bred man like Richard could be capable of such a crime. They called up to Richard, hoping to get his attention. A small, pale hand stuck out of one of the barred windows. A scrap of parchment paper dropped to the ground. The crowd stood, transfixed as the note fell, darting left and right on the early spring breeze. Finally, one man caught it. He ripped it open to reveal two words. Not guilty. Last week, we covered Helen's upbringing and how her life changed when she met Richard Robinson. This week, we'll cover the investigation into her death and why her likely killer was never convicted. We have all that and more coming up. Stay with us. In 1836, 
23-year-old Helen Jewett was an ambitious young woman who had climbed to the top of New York City's sex trade. She was one of the most coveted sex workers in the city, servicing lawyers, doctors, and businessmen from her room in a lower Manhattan brothel. Helen's fame took on a darker tone on the morning of April 10th. Rosina Townsend, the owner and manager of Helen's brothel, found that someone had lit Helen's bed on fire, and Helen's body was still lying on top of it, hacked to death by an axe. Rosina quickly alerted the authorities, and as detectives descended on the crime scene, a crowd of curious pedestrians followed. And then, early this morning, I was woken up by a knock at the door. That wasn't unusual. People are coming and going at all times of night. As I let the visitor in, I started to notice some things amiss in the house. So I went upstairs to see if everything was all right with Helen. Were her clothes burned off too? Wouldn't that be a sight? So you saw her last? I wasn't the last person to see her, no. Uh, The last time I saw Helen, alive, that is, was around 11 last night when I brought champagne upstairs for her and her companion. He wasn't her usual Saturday night customer, but I'd seen them together a few times. He went by the name Frank Rivers. Most Saturdays, Helen was visited by a man named George Marston, who used the nickname Bill Easy in the brothel. But the night of her death... Helen told Rosina she was expecting someone else, a young man who went by the name Frank Rivers. Rosina knew that was the code name for Richard Robinson. Richard had met Helen less than a year before in the summer of 1835. Though they started as a sex worker and client, the pair quickly developed more serious feelings for each other. Their on-again, off-again romance lasted 10 months, punctuated by multiple fights, breakups, and reconciliations. Richard tried to put an end to their tumultuous relationship in March of 1836, but Helen had insisted that he come see her one last time, on Richard's 19th birthday. It was the last night Helen spent alive. After Rosina found the fire blazing in Helen's room, her first thought was that Richard Robinson was the murderer— and that he had likely escaped through the backyard. When the police swept the house for evidence, they found a hatchet in the rear yard. It looked like it had been dropped there when the killer jumped over a fence. A watchman checked the other side of the fence and found a long cloak lying on the ground. According to Rosina, Richard had been wearing a cloak when he entered the brothel. Just a few hours into their investigation, the police were fairly convinced that Richard was the man to catch. But they were puzzled by another piece of evidence, a handkerchief with a man's initials sewn onto it. It had been stuffed under one of Helen's pillows when she died in her bed and bore the initials G.M. These likely stood for George Marston, the man who usually visited Helen on Saturday nights. But that wasn't exactly proof that Marston was the killer. All signs still pointed towards Richard. And so, as the sun rose and the crowd continued to grow outside the house on Thomas Street, the two officers in charge of the investigation decided to leave the crime scene and find their suspect. Richard lived in a boarding house about half a mile from the brothel, and he shared a bedroom with another clerk named James Two. Police arrived at the house around 7 in the morning and were led to Richard and James's room by a young servant. Hello? We're sleeping. To hell with sleeping. Open it up. What do you want? Are you Richard Robinson? No, he's right there. Shake him awake then. We're police. <gasps> morning, Mr. Robinson. You're coming with us to the police station. I don't understand. I haven't done anything. We'll see about that. Get your trousers on, kid. The officer noticed that Richard seemed unnaturally calm, even when they told him that Helen Jewett was dead. And when they finally told him he was being arrested for her murder, Richard denied the charge. One officer later testified Richard only showed emotion once that morning. The color drained from his face when the police carriage turned towards the brothel on Thomas Street. In 19th century criminal investigations, 
it was customary to take a murder suspect back to the scene of the crime and force them to look at the body. Richard was ushered through the crowd and into the parlor. The room was filled with key witnesses along with the city coroner and two owners of neighboring brothels. Again, Richard didn't show any concern about being a murder suspect. While waiting to see the grisly crime scene, he chatted with the witnesses and wholeheartedly denied his involvement. So you're the one who did it? Uh, According to the officers, I am. I can't believe everything they tell you, though. If you don't mind me asking, what would induce you to do something so cruel? Splitting the poor girl's head open, burning her to a crisp. I, I, I am innocent. You would have to be utterly stupid to think me otherwise. I, I am a young man, only 19 years of age yesterday, and I have brilliant prospects. Do you really think I would ruin those by doing something so ridiculous? Mm, that's a fair point. And besides, they found a handkerchief with another man's name on it under poor Helen's pillow. How could I be afraid of being convicted with evidence like that? No talking to the suspect, ma'am. The officers studied Richard as he faced Helen's body. He hardly reacted when the sheet was pulled off of her, revealing a charred, bloody mess on the crumbling bed. Instead, Richard continued to insist that he was innocent saying that he had been in his room at the boarding house after 11 p.m. the night before. Luckily, James had followed his friend to the crime scene and was waiting outside the house. The officers pulled him inside to confirm Richard's story. All right, I'll admit it. We both visited the brothel last night. But I finished with my woman about 10.30, went home, and was asleep by 11.15. Richard came in soon after. Yeah, and how do you know that? Woke up at about an hour past midnight. Richard was still awake, said he'd come in at half past eleven. And you believed him? You didn't check your watch? <laughs> I spent too much time at the whorehouse to afford one of those. There wasn't a clock on the wall? <laughs> too dark to see it. Very well. What about this? Does this cloak look like something you've seen in Mr. Robinson's closet? Well, yes, I mean... I haven't seen that particular cloak before, but Robinson does have one similar to it. It's a fairly common cloak. James, too, accidentally admitted that the cloak found near the fence looked like one of Richard's. This gave the investigators and coroner just enough information to cart the 19-year-old Richard off to Bridewell Prison in Lower Manhattan. By midday on Sunday, April 10th, the case seemed to be closed. Richard, the only suspect, was in prison, and the crowd of spectators outside the brothel was starting to thin. But as twilight approached, a man arrived who would turn this grisly crime story into the most talked about news item of 1836. Up next, we'll talk about the explosive press coverage of Helen's murder. The commotion around Helen Jewett's crime scene seemed to be dying down by the late afternoon on April 10th, 1836. But first, guards allowed one last visitor inside. His name was James Gordon Bennett, and he was the 41-year-old editor of the New York Herald. The Herald was one of the most popular newspapers in New York City, and Bennett was a well-known figure. The paper had only been around for a year, but it had quickly gained popularity as one of the city's so-called penny papers. These newspapers were cheaper to buy than six-cent broadsheet newspapers like the New York Times and the Evening Post, and were mostly read by the working class. The broadsheet newspapers were written for businessmen and focused on national politics and economics. Penny papers were intended for a much wider audience and published local news, crime, and gossip stories. Most of their coverage had a whimsical, sarcastic tone, and they easily blurred the lines between fact and fiction. Bennett had already used high-profile crime stories to draw readers to his paper. When he heard about the brutal murder of a well-known sex worker, he knew he couldn't pass it up. So he took a private tour of the house with a plan to write about it in his Monday column. The editor wandered around the house, taking note of everything he saw. The piece he later wrote was called Visit to a Scene and offered the general public their first impression of Helen's murder. 
The parlor was elegantly furnished with mirrors, paintings, and every variety of costly furniture, and was decorated far more richly than one may expect for a house of ill repute. I ascended the stairs and entered the crime scene. What a sight! What was once an elegant mahogany bed, all covered with burnt pieces of linen, blankets, and pillows black as cinders. And the body! I could scarcely look at it, and yet it was the most remarkable sight I ever beheld. My god, I said. She is like a statue. The body looked as white, as full, as polished as the purest marble. The perfect figure, the fine face, the beautiful bust, all surpassing Venus herself. Bennett's article was gory and unnecessarily erotic, but it also gave readers a sense of Helen's personality and interests. He detailed the collection of books and literary journals on her shelves, the eloquent love letters on her desk, and the portrait of Lord Byron hanging over her bed. But it was the titillating details of the crime scene that caught the public's attention. In many ways, the murder was perfectly suited to the penny press. It involved sex, crime, and romance, all big selling points, and could be tied into the ongoing political debates around sex work in the city. It put a human face on sex workers and gave curious readers a window into the illicit world of high-class brothels. The murder of Helen Jewett was the first sex crime to get detailed coverage in the American press. And it was so popular that some historians cite it as the first example of tabloid journalism. Circulation of penny papers skyrocketed when they started to cover Helen's murder. And soon, the more established six-cent papers joined in. With so many publications now covering the case, each editor and reporter was forced to take a distinct position on who killed Helen Jewett and why. In the early days of the case, most of the press coverage said that Richard Robinson was innocent. It cannot possibly be Robinson. How could a man of only 19 years do something so brutal? I've seen this young man, and I doubt that he's man enough to grow a beard. His face is sweet and smooth, Hardly the look of a murderer. And when I examined the crime scene closely, I couldn't help but think to myself, does this not look like the work of a woman? Which do I believe to be more likely, that a respectable boy killed Miss Jewett, or that one of her neighboring women, wretched and friendless as they are, was responsible? It seemed that most people in the city were on Richard's side. At least most of the middle-class men who wrote for newspapers were. But this small group had an oversized influence on how the public thought about the suspect. Some young men in the city immediately hailed Richard as a hero and formed groups they called Robinsonian Juntos. These were gangs of upper-class young men who dressed like Richard and wandered around the city harassing sex workers in Richard's name. They all wore a purple dress coat, a black scarf, and a floppy hat imitating the drawings of Richard they had seen in the newspaper. Richard's supporters sent anonymous, threatening letters to Rosina Townsend, saying that she would be killed, just like Helen, if she testified against him. Rosina continued to talk to the press about what she saw the night of April 9th, but also hired a permanent security guard for the house. Though the evidence against Richard was strong, the so-called Robinsonians believed that he had a promising future and shouldn't be punished for what they saw as a youthful mistake. They believed that his reputation and future were worth more than Helen Jewett's life. Seeing all the controversy and drama that the murder had already created, newspaper men like James Gordon Bennett were eager to keep the story going. Before long, New York's penny papers were engaged in an arms race to find new information about Helen, Richard, and the days leading up to Helen's death. For his next column, Bennett attempted to write a definitive account of Helen's early life. But when he interviewed her friends and former clients, he couldn't get a clear picture. Some said that she was born to a wealthy family and forced into sex work by a teenage lover. Others said she had been poor all her life and chose sex work out of necessity. It became clear that Helen had made up multiple false backstories for herself, using them to get what she wanted from clients. Now that she was dead, these stories clashed into each other. Bennett and his readers were unsure of who Helen really was and if she was deserving of their sympathy. 
Was she the virginal daughter of an army major forced into a life of sin or a wicked seductress who got what she deserved? As Bennett continued to dig into the story, questions about Richard Robinson's background and character also started to emerge. As more information came out about him, he seemed less and less like an innocent boy and more like a remorseless, self-centered killer. Just five days after he had defended Richard's innocence in the newspaper, James Gordon Bennett got a hold of the 19-year-old's diary. Somehow, an enterprising reporter got access to it before it was entered into the police investigation. The reporter was shocked by the things Richard wrote and allowed multiple newspapers to print excerpts of the diary on April 15, 1836. Even Bennett, who had championed Richard's innocence, found it hard to defend him after the man's most private thoughts were revealed. I am fully aware that I am smarter than the average man, even at my young age. I carry an old head between these young shoulders, certainly. New acquaintances often seem to confuse my quick wit with something like honesty or innocence. I suppose I should let the world continue to see me as a blameless church-going boy. Then perhaps they won't notice my darker side. Richard's diary revealed him to be vulgar, self-centered, and manipulative. He detailed his sexual exploits with a cold, removed tone and seemed to delight in fooling people, especially women, about his true nature. He had a dramatic streak, consistently claiming that he was smarter than everyone he met and that no one would ever be able to understand him. He also complained about making only $60 per year at his job. If he was making such low wages, he had to have had another source of income to be visiting sex workers so often. A few newspapers suspected that he was engaged in an illegal financial operation. It was getting harder and harder to portray Richard as someone who was too young and pure to be capable of crime. Even the pro-Robinson camp changed their tune. They began to say that even if Richard wasn't a particularly moral man, plenty of young men acted and spoke just like him. He might have been badly behaved or even malicious, but that didn't make him a murderer. Richard remained quiet when his diary was published. His last words to the public had been on the night of his arrest when he proclaimed his innocence by dropping a note to the spectators outside Bridewell Prison. His lawyer advised him not to speak to anyone until his trial, which was scheduled for June of 1836. Interest in the case reached a fever pitch a few weeks before the trial. Enterprising printers started selling pamphlets that retold the story of the murder, including made-up quotes from both Helen and Richard. These pamphlets also included portraits of the pair, as well as sexualized drawings of Helen's corpse. Helen's real body was buried a few days after the murder in an Episcopalian graveyard. Her grave was unmarked, but robbers still found it. Helen's body was in the ground for only four days before papers claimed it was stolen by a group of medical students on April 16, 1836, and that her skeleton was on display in one of their classrooms. The runaway sales of newspapers, pamphlets, and drawings show that there was plenty of money to be made on the murder, and even Rosina wanted in on it. With her brothel business at a standstill, Rosina was desperate to tap into the zeitgeist. So, in late April 1836, she auctioned off the furniture from Helen's room. <clears throat> Our next item is Miss Jewett's bed. Of course, it was damaged by the fire, but I paid a fair price for it, so we'll start the bidding at $70. I'll pay $100. $100? Huh, I'll double that. $200! I'm afraid it isn't worth quite that much, sir. It's falling apart. <laughs> oh, we're not looking to sleep on it. $300. Uh, sold, I suppose. Perfect. Come on, boys, let's divide it up then. Who wants a splinter of the bed? Some relic of Miss Jewett's departed worth. Two dollars a piece. Who wants a souvenir? <laughs> After the April 20th sale turned into a macabre free-for-all, Rosina abandoned the brothel. All of the residents moved out and the Thomas Street house stood vacant. On at least two occasions, New Yorkers reported seeing a ghostly version of Helen staring out of one of the brothel's windows. 
Sometimes there was a hatchet floating behind her. Most people agreed that the spectral figure was a hoax. Still, pedestrians gathered outside the empty building every night, hoping to catch a glimpse of Helen's ghost. By May of 1836, it seemed like Helen Jewett's morbid celebrity was at its peak. But Richard was about to go to trial, and what happened in the courtroom was so unexpected and controversial that it pushed her stardom even higher. Up next, we'll talk about Richard Robinson's trial. Now, back to the story. Richard Robinson's trial opened on June 2nd, 1836. About 6,000 people showed up in New York City Hall that morning. Many of them wore the purple coats and floppy hats that distinguished them as Robinsonians. They waited to rush into the courtroom and grab a seat for their hero's trial. The room only fit 1,000 of them. The rest of the crowd ended up spilling down a marble staircase through the building's lobby and out into the late spring rain. According to the newspapers, the vast majority of the spectators were male, and most of them were there to support Richard Robinson. There he is, our hero himself. Richard, good luck. We're all rooting for you out here. Mr. Robinson isn't speaking to anyone right now. Oh, come on. He can say a little something to us fine Robinsonians, can he? Richard, don't be so stone-faced. Give us a taste of what you'll do in there. I will insist upon my innocence. No more, no less. There he is! Knew I'd get him! Twelve jurors were chosen. All of them were white men, and most were in the middle or upper class. They came into the courtroom already biased toward Richard. They could easily sympathize with him and were more likely to give him the benefit of the doubt. The prosecution team knew that they were fighting an uphill battle. Before the jury could even think to convict Richard, they had to overcome their biases against sex workers and be convinced that Helen deserved justice. Once the jury was seated and the rowdy audience settled down, the lead prosecutor brought Rosina, the former brothel owner, to the stand. She confidently related what she saw the night of the murder. She had seen Richard with Helen just a few hours beforehand and was sure that no one else had exited or entered the house in the meantime. Richard's legal team tried to find inconsistencies in Rosina's story, pressing her for so many details that her testimony took nearly five hours to complete. Despite the defense team's attempts to discredit and confuse Rosina, the madam stuck to her story. As other witnesses for the prosecution paraded through the courtroom, the jury seemed to be leaning toward a guilty verdict for Richard. The prosecutors methodically presented all of the evidence that linked Richard to the crime scene. First, they mentioned the hatchet found in the backyard and brought in a doctor who matched it up with Helen's head wounds. Then, a watchman described finding a cloak near the scene of the crime, and the attorneys pointed out a distinctive tassel near the collar. Another sex worker testified that she had seen Richard in that cloak multiple times, and that the tassel had fallen off while they were on a sleigh ride together that winter. Upon closer inspection, the tassel on the cloak found in the backyard did appear to be re-sewn. The repair might have been done by Helen herself, who occasionally mended and embroidered her favorite client's clothes as a sign of affection. The attorneys also countered Richard's idea that the handkerchief found in Helen's bed would prove his innocence, They brought George Marston, one of Helen's most consistent customers, to the stand. George's initials were sewn into the handkerchief found under Helen's pillow, casting some suspicion on him. But the police stopped viewing him as a suspect when he explained that he had given the handkerchief to Helen, along with other items to sew and wash. He was nowhere near the brothel on Saturday night, and the placement of the handkerchief seemed like a mere coincidence. It's possible that Richard deliberately planted the evidence in an attempt to frame George. But on the third day of the trial, just as evidence was mounting against Richard's legal team, they revealed a surprise witness. The defense called a 33-year-old grocer named Robert Furlong to the stand. Robert claimed to have seen Richard in his store on the night of the murder. Mr. Furlong, 
you say that Mr. Robinson entered your store about 9.30? Yes, sir. Came in around then, bought a bundle of cigars, and sat on one of my barrels in the corner reading the evening post until 10.15. And you're absolutely sure that you're not confusing Mr. Robinson with someone else? No, sir. Mr. Robinson was a regular customer of mine. I'd recognize him anywhere. When I noticed he hadn't been in in a few days, I checked the papers. And there he was, in every headline. Mr. Furlong, you realize that another witness, Miss Rosina Townsend, claims that the suspect was in her house between the hours of 9.30 and 10.15, correct? Are we to believe that there are two Richard Robinsons? I suppose it does come down to her word against mine. But whose words would you rather take? A young gentleman like me, or a woman with a reputation like Miss Townsend's? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if the old hag is even capable of reading a clock. Robert's testimony was extremely important for Richard Robinson. It could completely discredit Rosina's testimony, if it were true. Strangely, no one came forward to state that they had also seen Richard at the grocer's on the night of the murder. And Richard hadn't mentioned buying cigars when the police asked him about his whereabouts on April 9th. In fact, some of Richard's acquaintances weren't even sure if he smoked cigars. The grocer's testimony did not seem reliable to most of the reporters covering the story. Some even said outright that the witness was lying in their coverage of the trial. But the jury wasn't so quick to dismiss Robert Furlong's story. Some of them cheered during his cross-examination, eager to take any information that contradicted Rosina. The jury also could have been generous toward Robert's testimony because of a personal connection. Two of the jurors were grocers, and three others were merchants who owned businesses within a few blocks of Robert Furlong's store. In a modern court, connections like these would likely be labeled a conflict of interest and lead to the jurors' dismissal, but these conflicts weren't seen as a problem in 1836. To make matters worse for the prosecution, many of their possible witnesses refused to testify. Most of Rosina's customers did not want their secret dealings with sex workers brought to public light. While sex work was not strictly illegal at the time, it was still socially taboo, and that taboo extended to the sex workers themselves. Those women who testified were generally disrespected and disregarded by both the rowdy spectators and members of the jury. That wasn't the prosecutor's only problem. The judge threw out key pieces of evidence, like the clearly abusive letters sent between Helen and Richard because he worried they weren't genuine. The letters would have helped the prosecution establish a motive for Richard by showing his threatening, manipulative behavior towards Helen. The final blow came after five days of heated testimony when Judge Ogden Edwards summed up the case and instructed the jury. Evening, gentlemen. Before I let you go off to debate the boy's innocence, I must remind you that in order to convict, you must be sure of Mr. Robinson's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt. I encourage you to think critically about the voices you have heard these last five days and consider weighing the character of these witnesses before coming to any decision. To be frank, it is my opinion that the prostitutes in this case are not credible and should not be listened to unless their testimony is corroborated by better sources. My court will not accept testimony that relies only on their words. Judge Edwards blatantly told the jury to disregard all of the evidence brought by Rosina Townsend and other sex workers because he saw them to be unreliable. And with that... He basically made the jury's decision for them. Richard Robinson was found not guilty. Richard walked out of City Hall as a free man. He was greeted by a crowd of thousands. He's out! Mr. Robinson, I'm from the New York Herald. Now that you're free, does your conscience trouble you at all? Not a bit. Of course, I didn't do it. Only an idiot would use a hatchet to cut up a girl. Besides, I'm more of a jackknife man. How do you feel about your newfound celebrity? Oh, I fear I don't deserve it. I've always known myself to be handsome and intriguing, but the attention overwhelms me. The public views you as a savage, though. The public is stupid. Last question. After this trial, what's next for you? I'm headed west to join the Desperados in Texas. The Alamo needs defending, or so I've been told. 
in July of 1836. Richard Robinson changed his name to Richard Parmalee and boarded a steamboat to Texas. During the trip, Richard joined in on conversations about the murder of Helen Jewett whenever it came up. Each time, he calmly defended Richard Robinson without revealing that he was Robinson. Richard rarely spoke about Helen once he settled in Nacogdoches, Texas, but he likely never forgot about her. According to local rumor, he kept a pamphlet about the murder on his parlor table until the day he died in 1855. Looking over everything, I think that Richard Robinson is the only real suspect in this case. He and Helen had been in a violent relationship for months. He may have seen murder as the easiest way out of their love affair. I agree. The circumstantial evidence against Richard is just too much to ignore. If he actually had a fair trial, he would have likely gone to jail. In any case, the murder of Helen Jewett first made headlines because of its gory details. But as the trial moved forward, it became less about Helen and Richard and more about their class, gender, and position in society. If Richard had been convicted, the story would be tragic but unremarkable. But as his treatment in court offered a stark reminder that some lives seemed to be worth more than others in the eyes of the law. While Helen Jewett was turned into a gruesome public spectacle, Richard Robinson used his class status and gender to literally get away with murder. <laughs> 